present is Dan Floyd, our resident expert here at Nelson Laboratories. Just as a reminder, if, if you uh, miss one of our webinars or would like to refer back to uh, one of our webinars, you can always find them on our webinars page, which is under the Knowledge Center on the www.nelsonlabs.com website. It will be up there a few days after the webinar. Um, also, you can receive these types of notifications and other testing news and updates if you want to follow Nelson Labs on Facebook or Twitter. Um, as for the webinar, we welcome your questions and you can submit them anytime. Uh, Dan will randomly answer as many as he can during our last 15 minutes uh, of the webinar. And we ask that if you have a product specific question, you write it down and then you can contact Dan about it after the webinar. Um, Dan's information will be displayed on the final screen, but you can reach him at area code 801-290-7868 or dfloyd at nelsonlabs.com. Now let me uh, give you a little bit of background information on Dan. Dan is a laboratory manager at Nelson Laboratories and he's over the ethylene oxide packaging and biocompatibility departments. For the last 18 plus years, he's specialized in all aspects of EO validations, including cycle development, devalue determinations, bio burden resistance studies, biological indicator sterility testing, BI incubation reduction studies, comparative resistant testing, DCD development, and temperature and humidity studies, and I'm sure there's probably some more. Uh, Dan received his, his BS in microbiology and a minor in chemistry from Brigham Young University where he attended on a presidential scholarship. Following his graduation, he became a registered microbiologist with the National Registry of Microbiology. Dan is a participating member on several AMI working groups including industrial ethylene oxide sterilization, biological indicators, beer vessels, and process challenge devices. Welcome, Dan. The time is now yours. Before we get started, we wanted to talk a little bit about uh, this seminar. This is cramming in about an hour's worth of information, which is normally done in maybe about a half a day seminar. So uh, when we start, we want to go ahead and uh, talk about, hang on here, we got a technical difficulty. When you want to talk about the seminars that we do, we, we do a lot of educational seminars, typically about twice a year. The next one we have coming up is October 5th through the 7th in Orlando, Florida. Um, it's at Disney's Boardwalk Inn. And so this will go into a lot more detail, get into a little more technical information and a lot more in depth. So there's another one in November in Costa Rica for those of you that want to rack up the, the frequent flyer miles and uh, get away from uh, the cold parts of the U.S. in November. So keep that in mind. These are two to three day seminars that we typically do. So we're going to cram a lot of this information in one hour. So um, it, it won't go into a lot of depth on some things. But uh, certainly feel free to contact me at any time. And we can go into more information if we'd like. What we want to talk about today is we're going to briefly go over the history and properties of ethylene oxide, some of the very critical definitions, some of the testing that you have to do prior to doing your validation, the validation itself, and then some standards, the standards uh, themselves. So if you look at the history of ethylene oxide, it's uh, got a very long history with it. It was first discovered back in 1859 by a chemist named Charles Wirtz. But it wasn't until 1928, some 70 years later, that it was first uh, shown that it had insecticidal properties. Following that, in a few years later, 1933, the first patent was issued that was using ethylene oxide to destroy microorganisms. And then in the late 1940s, it was first used for medical supplies and instruments, and that's why we're here today. So it has a long history behind it. <clears throat> the advantage of a long history is long history equals good regulatory acceptance. And because it is so well known, then uh, it's something that it's, if you're sterilizing a device with that, it's something that's going to be much easier to get through the regulatory bodies because it's a known entity. It's one of the most studied chemicals that there are out there. So briefly, we're going to go into some of the properties of ethylene oxide. As most of you know, it's a colorless, odorless gas. It's, uh, it does have a slight odor, kind of like an ether when you're in toxic concentrations, um, anywhere from 5 to 700 milligrams per liter. So if you can smell it, you're, uh, 
you're definitely exposing yourself to very high levels. So it is odorless and colorless. It's very reactive. This is one of the things that makes ethylene oxide such a great sterilant because it's reacting. It's, it's always trying to open up and react with other things, including the organism's uh, DNA and cellular components, and that's what disrupts them and uh, causes their death. And because it's always trying to open up, it's got these strain bond angles. It has a short carbon-carbon bond that it's used primarily for a versatile chemical intermediate. It's used to make a lot of other industrial chemicals. Some facts about ethylene oxide. It's estimated that over 42 billion pounds are produced annually. So it, it's the 11th largest manufactured chemical annually. 99% of it's used for other industrial chemicals such as uh, antifreeze, ethylene glycol is used for that. About 60% of the ethylene oxide is used for antifreeze, also used for polyesters and detergents. So when you're out with your Saturday night leisure suit and your polyester suit, uh, you have ethylene oxide to thank for that. Um, one, of the, one of the things that a lot of people find surprising is that less than 1% of it is used for sterilization applications. In our business, it's, it's basically everything that we do, but if you look at the overall picture of how much is actually produced annually, only 1% is used for sterilization. It is a toxic uh, chemical. Uh, there's good things and bad things about that. The good, things, the good thing is that it makes it an excellent sterilant. It has to be toxic. Um, the, the bad thing is, and obviously if you're working with it or working around it, it can cause some health issues. OSHA has set action levels of 0.5 parts per million as an action level. If you're exposed to that over an eight-hour time-weighted average, that's what the TWA is. And then the permissible exposure limit over an eight-hour day is one parts per million. They also have a, what they call the excursion limit. So if you were pulling samples, for instance, and um, unloading a sterilizer, something like that, where you're exposed to it for around a 15-minute period of time, you could be exposed up to five parts per million. They also have what's called the immediately dangerous to life and health, which is 800 parts per million. So obviously, you wouldn't want to be exposed to that such a, a high concentration, or it's going to be uh, very dangerous. Another issue that it has is its flammability. It's flammable as a liquid and explosive as a vapor. Uh, the flammable range of ethylene oxide in air is, is 2.6 all the way up to 100% to pure ethylene oxide. It creates its own oxygen when it burns, so that creates a unique problem. If you look at propane in comparison, it's, it's only flammable up to a maximum range of 9.5%, so it, it's a lot less flammable uh, propane is than ethylene oxide if you look at it in that regard. Um, static electricity alone is sufficient to ignite ethylene oxide, and so there can be issues with that at the uh, large industrial drums and tanks that they use at contract sterilizers typically have grounding straps on those to prevent any uh, discharge of static electricity that could potentially uh, be an ignition source. It is a highly exothermic reaction and it gives off a lot of, of energy and heat. There's four different parameters of ethylene oxide. When you're looking at lethality and the ability to kill with ethylene oxide, all four of these have to work in conjunction. You have temperature, relative humidity, gas concentration, and exposure time. So all four of these, it's a very complex system because you have to have all four of these within their specifications or you can have issues with, with uh, the delivered sterility assurance level. This is probably one of the most complex methods of sterilization because of that. If you look at something uh, like radiation, in contrast, it has one parameter, just dose. So that's the only thing you have to worry about. But with ethylene oxide, you have to closely monitor all four of these. That's why it's, it's a lot harder to do parametric release and things like that with ethylene oxide because of these. And we'll go through these different parameters and show you the importance of each of them. Temperature, if somebody comes to me and, and they have a failure with the load or they have BIs that grew and they're, they're just designing a cycle, temperature is probably the one item that we, we always ask them, how high can you go up? Because every 10 degrees Celsius that you increase the temperature, you're going to approximately double the inactivation rate of the microorganisms. So it's going to kill just that much faster. And so, uh, you know, we always look at that first. Typical cycles usually go around 120 to 130 degrees Fahrenheit. That's around, at the top, it's around 55 degrees Celsius. And so uh, you usually don't see cycles much more than above 55 to 57 degrees Celsius. But the higher you can go in temperature and still maintain your product functionality and, and package functionality, you're going to get that much more kill. So conversely, when you uh, decrease the temperature with that Q10 effect 
a lot of products nowadays are people are trying to sterilize at lower temperatures. We have some requests uh, to go down as low as 30 degrees Celsius because of drug-coated stents and combination devices and things like that that are very temperature sensitive. And so you have to keep that in mind that if you're going to lower the temperature, most likely your, your exposure time is going to have to be longer. So it's going to create some problems in cycle development for you. But that, that is becoming more and more of an issue. As you increase the temperature, you may also increase the permeability both through the packaging itself as well as a lot of the polymers in the device. So it may help just get the ethylene oxide into the, the device faster. The next one, next parameter you look at is relative humidity. Water is needed for the alkylation reaction. With, with ethylene oxide, it's considered an alkylation reaction as opposed to an oxidation reaction, like something like hydrogen peroxide would be. And with that, you need water to uh, assist that reaction. It's not widely understood the exact mechanisms of the reaction, but it's thought to disrupt the uh, cellular components and the DNA of the organisms. And you look at that, uh, if you look at the spore level, it's been uh, studied and reported that the optimum humidity level to get the most kill is around 35%. But typically you're going to see in industrial cycles, you're going to see a, a wide range. Typically what you see is 30 to 80% is what's considered uh, optimal. You don't want to have too much where you're getting a lot of condensation and you also don't want it to have it too low. So you need some humidity to do that. It's also going to assist in transference of the ethylene oxide. It, it helps to basically act as a carrier to uh, assist the ethylene oxide to get through the uh, packaging itself. And uh, you, know, you look at something like nylon. Nylon is, is something that uh, if you have moisture involved, it's going to permeate fairly readily. But if you had dry ethylene oxide by itself, it's not going to get through that, that very well. So relative humidity is used a lot in the preconditioning process. Basically, preconditioning in the cycle is for two different purposes. One, you use it to increase the temperature to get the load back up to temperature. And the second part is to introduce humidity into the chamber. Um, what you want to do with that is you pull out all the air as well, because what you're trying to do is replace the air with something that's non-condensable. Air is a, is a non-condensable gas, so you want to replace it with a condensable gas, some, something like water vapor, because what that's going to do is it's going to help, uh, the water vapor is going to help you basically allow the ethylene oxide to flow through. If you have aluminum of a catheter, it's going to help flow through that area more than instead of diffusing if it, if it butts up against air that's trapped inside that. So air removal is very important, but the humidity is important as well. Not quite as critical as temperature. For instance, if you're using a cycle that has 30 degrees relative, or 30 percent, excuse me, relative humidity, and you increase it to 40, you're not going to see much difference at all. So as long as you're within that range of 30 to 80, um, it doesn't really help the the uh, lethality to the same degree that temperature would. So let's look at our third parameter, and that's gas concentration. Typical values, basically, gas concentration is how much ethylene oxide is in that, that confined space in the chamber. Common values are typically anywhere from 400 to 650 milligrams per liter in industrial cycles. Um, occasionally, you see cycles higher than that, lower than that. Uh, several years ago, we saw cycles that were, with using a lot of the gas mixtures, would go over 1,000 milligrams per liter. There's been a lot of work on what they call the, the uh, plateau effect. And that's basically, as you increase your EO concentration, you're going to increase your lethality up to a certain point. And then after that, it's not going to do any good. So at typical sterilization temperatures, which are around 55 degrees Celsius, that point's been shown to be around 500 milligrams per liter. So you know, most people will go a little above that, 650 or so. That allows you to have some absorbance into the uh, packaging, into the cardboard, uh, the corrugate of the, the shipper boxes, and so on and still maintain that 500 milligrams per liter. So that's kind of your maximum dose. You go above that, it's not really going to do you much much more good. As you lower the temperature, that plateau effect increases. So for those devices we talked about earlier, the combination devices and so on, the uh, plateau effect, you're still going to get more effect all the way up to 800 milligrams per liter. So you got to look at the temperature you're using and also uh, what your concentration is. So gas concentration is fairly important, but also a range of around 400 to 650 is real common. And finally, this one's kind of a no-brainer. This is exposure time. It's basically the time that it sits in the sterilizer. It's going to add, pre add gas up to the target pressure and just sit there. And this is where you're killing the microorganisms or anything that could be on the device. And it, typically, you're going to see it's really product 
specific. It's really dependent on how hard the product is in conjunction with the load configuration and the packaging can add to that. So typically anywhere from two to ten hours is common uh, exposure times. Really, like I said, it really depends more on the product, how, how specific it is. So cycles range kind of all over the place. Uh, we see some extreme ones and some very, some even shorter than that. So it really just depends. And it's really dependent on the time it takes to get the gas into that area. You've got to remember ethylene oxide is a gas, so it has to penetrate into, through the boxes, through the packaging, and into the deeper recesses of the product. It, it is very penetrating. In some cases, it's going to go right through the walls of plastics and penetrate in through that. So it is very penetrating. But the time that it takes, once it gets to where it needs to go, it's going to kill the organisms very rapidly. So that's just a matter of, of minutes. But uh, it may take hours to get the gas to that, that specific spot in the device. And, and every device, as you know, is, is a lot of different configurations. So some devices that are, you're just looking at surface sterility can be quite easy to sterilize. Other ones with, uh, you know, you see some of these catheters nowadays that have five or six foot lumens that have internal uh, clearances of only a few thousandths of an inch. And so to get the gas down that, that small space is sometimes a challenge. And now that we see the effects of the different parameters, it, it's important to understand how an ethylene oxide cycle works. Most uh, industrial sterilizers use 100% ethylene oxide. Those cycles are always run under a vacuum, uh, primarily for flammability reasons. So what you do if you look at the graph and you look at the line as you go from left to right, the first Part of that is you basically you put the product in the chamber, and then it's going to close the door, and you're going to pull a vacuum. And so the packaging um, and the product has to, has to be breathable, and you have to be able to allow pressure changes, because there are, there are several different vacuum and pressure changes that, that the product and packaging are going to see throughout the course of a cycle. The first step, as we mentioned, you pull a vacuum, you're going to pull down to a target point. Again, this is to get the air out of the devices, out of the load, out of the packaging to assist so that the ethylene oxide can flow into those areas easier instead of trying to diffuse up against it. So you're going to get the air out, then you're going to add steam up to a certain target vessel to whatever your humidity set point is. Typically that's going to be held. It may be a 60 minute hold time. There might be multiple repeats of that. And that, again, that's just to bring the, temp the product back up to temperature, back up to humidity before the ethylene oxide gas is added. So the next line up then is the uh, is the gas addition. You start adding ethylene oxide on top of the steam so it adds up to a certain target point. And uh, during this point you start to get kill as gas becomes in contact with the product. So you still get kill even though your, your exposure time is not officially started yet. Sometimes this can be fairly dramatic. It may take 45 minutes or so to add gas up to your target pressure, 20 minutes. So you're getting that additional time on the front end and also on the back end. Of, of kill, and sometimes that can be when you're doing fractional cycles and things like that, that can cause you some issues. So once you start exposure again, you get to your target point, and that's where the timer starts. So if you're, you have a two-hour exposure, it's going to start timing there. If your pressure drops, you may or may not have gas makeups. Um, some people do, some people don't. A lot of people like to maintain that pressure at whatever the set point is, and so if it does absorb, into the product or the packaging and it drops the pressure a little bit, it's going to add a little bit more to keep it right at that target pressure. So once you go through exposure, then at the end of that, then this is where you're trying to remove the ethylene oxide because it's toxic. Uh, like we mentioned, there's, there's defined limits that can be used on a patient, but also for flammability reasons and worker safety issues, you have to do a lot of air washes following the cycle to try to reduce the concentration First, you're going to remove it from the, the space around the load, then you're going to try to pull it out. On the back end as you can, so that it does fall below those limits that are outlined in ISO 10993-7. Once you understand how the cycle works, it's very important to understand the overkill concept. This is critical to basically all types of sterilization with the exception of, of radiation. Um, dry heat, steam, vaporized hydrogen peroxide, ethylene oxide, a lot of these use this overkill concept. And it's basically taking the concept that you're exposing very high levels of highly resistant spores in most cases whatever the indicator organism for the specific
sterilization method, you're using that basically showing you can kill those high levels of spores in half the cycle time. And then you're gonna, your routine cycle is going to be double that. So if you look at this graph, you're starting with 10 to the 6 or 1 million. And most commercially made biological indicators have a population of at least 1.0 times 10 to the 6 or 1 million spores per strip, replacing these spore strips throughout your product load. And you're basically saying, if I can kill a million of these highly resistant spores in half the time, then there's a good chance, because it's all a probability when you're looking at the sterility assurance level, that that product bio burden's been killed off way before that. So there's a little bit, and we'll get into how that's done, of how you tie the two together. Because basically, you're, you're saying, if I kill this biological indicator, I'm showing that my product's sterile. And we'll get into that. But if you see on this graph, that the half cycle time in this case is two hours. So it's going to take two hours to get complete kill of the biological indicators. So that makes your routine production cycle would be four hours. And so you can see the overkill built into it. And then when you look at that you're putting one million spores in the mo most difficult location of the device to sterilize, where you may only have one or two organisms in that location or no, organis no, no organisms in that particular location, you see you get a lot of times you get overkill on top of overkill. Then you may take that biological indicator and put it in some type of process challenge device. And we'll get into that in a second. And that even makes it even more difficult. So it's a very safe process. It provides a wide safety margin. And it really allows you large fluctuations in your product bio burden that's not going to affect your sterility assurance level. When you're looking at something like radiation, it's dependent on what your product bio burden is. And if your bio burden fluctuates, that's going to change your, your sterilization dose. But with ethylene oxide, you're not basing it on your product bio burden. So it does allow you a lot bigger fluctuations in your product bio burden. Biological indicator is obviously going to be a critical definition we're going to talk about. And basically what a biological indicator is, it's an inoculated carrier that contains a known population and known resistant to whatever sterilization process you're using. Different sterilization processes use different types of BIs, different organisms, depending on what type they are. And with ethylene oxide, what you're going to use is, is typically uh, you're going to use Bacillus atrophius an organism that used to be called Bacillus subtilis. It hasn't changed. They just changed the name of it. But in this picture that you see in front of you, if you see the blue like a rectangle envelope, that's what most people are familiar with when they think of a biological indicator. And in the middle of that is just a white piece of filter paper that the spores are, are uh, inoculated onto and allowed to dry. And those are either placed in the product or inside, inside some type of process challenge device. The purple ones, on the other hand, those are used for steam sterilization. If you notice, there's no strip in there because the spores are directly inoculated into the media. And the reason these work for steam is that particular organism is an organism called Geobacillus sterothermophilus, will not grow at, at temperatures below, usually around 50 degrees Celsius. It's, it's incubated at 55 to 60 degrees Celsius. So they just basically hang out dormant in that media. And so at room temperature, they're just going to hang out and not grow. You couldn't do that with an ethylene oxide BI because that particular organism, Bacillus atrophius, is going to grow at room temperature. So it would, it would change before you even did anything. So what they use is, if you're trying to use that same type of concept, is the uh, BIs with the orangish red caps that are up in the, the upper right portion of the picture. If you see in the bottom of that, you have to look close. And if you haven't seen these, you might not be able to, to visualize it as well because it's such a small picture. But in the bottom of that tube is a piece of filter paper, same type of filter paper that's in that blue strip. But on top of that is a glass vial that the media is contained into. And so the media is not in contact with the BI strip itself until you squeeze that and it breaks that glass vial. It's an inner glass vial that's contained inside a plastic outer vial. So you squeeze the outer vial, breaks the media, that comes in contact with the uh, BI strip, and then that can be incubated and, and grows. So lots of different types of biological indicators. You can even use your actual product if it's inoculated. It can, can be considered a biological indicator. Here's what the organism, Bacillus atrophius, looks like. The nice thing about this is it uh, has a, a fairly bright orange pigment. So it's very easy to distinguish. A lot of times you're looking at the BI tubes themselves. And just visually, you can tell if it's going to be a true positive by just looking at it. So it gives you a good heads up. You'll still go through the, the uh, bacterial identification and, and verify that down to species if you do have any positives. But it makes it a really nice organism to look at. A lot of the other ones <coughs> excuse me, are you know, just kind of white or cream colored when they grow, um, which is 
like most other organisms, so they're hard to distinguish. But this one really makes a nice, a nice indicator organism. It's a spore-forming organism, as we mentioned, uh, which which uh, makes it nice to put onto a biological indicator because spores are going to just hang out dormant, and just they'll stay there for you know most BIs have an expiration date of at least 18 months, so they're going to last a long time. That's why spores because they're the most resistant to a lot of chemical processes, that spore coat on there makes them very resistant. And so uh, that makes them an excellent organism to use for a biological indicator. And you can't use spores or you can't even use BIs for radiation sterilization. And a lot of people out there probably say, well, what about Bacillus pumulus, which is a, a BI strip that they use that's marketed for radiation. Uh, but the reason you can't use that is the spore formers are not the most resistant organisms to radiation. They're the most resistant organisms to radiation are the ones that repair their DNA uh, most quickly, and the, the, it's usually not the spore former, so a lot of things like micrococcus and so on. So it doesn't make a good, good indicator organism because you can't put a lot of these organisms on a strip and they're not going to maintain their population over time. So that's the reason you don't use that. Also, for that Bacillus pumulus, that organism, there's about 30% of the organisms in North America that are more resistant to or equal to radiation sterilization than that particular one. So that's why when you're using radiation sterilization, you're going to do more of a dosimetric release based on your actual product bile burden more than any type of biological indicator. Let's go back to process challenge devices. We skipped over that real quick. Basically, what a process challenge device is, a lot of the devices you have are either very difficult to inoculate. If you remember, the standard says that you have to put your biological challenge in the most resistant part of the, the product to sterilize. And that's a lot of times not easy to do. And the other reason is a lot of the devices may cost over $1,000 each. So you don't want to waste you know, several devices just to put biological indicators in when you can use something else. So a PCD is basically just something that mimics the resistance of your product that's going to be cheap and easy to work with. Something like a syringe is it we use commonly. Um, what you're going to do is compare that. We'll talk about how, how these are done. But a, a PCD makes it uh, something you can put the BI in where you don't have to actually use your actual devices. It doesn't have to look like your product. The configuration can be totally different. You, know, you don't have to have a tubing type thing if your, your product's a catheter. It's really just the resistance that you're looking at. So the resistances have to be either equal to or the PCD has to be greater in resistance than your actual product. So PCDs are commonly used in ethylene oxide sterilization. So now we're going to get into some of the pre-validation testing. This is all the upfront things that you need to do. So it's a, a quite inclusive list of things that you have to look at prior to actually taking your load to a contract sterilizer or doing it in-house and going through your, your validation. You have to look at things like biocompatibility, product functionality, package validation, uh, comparative and bioburden resistance, bioburden enumeration, population verification on your spore strips that you're using. All this stuff you want to do up front because you don't want to go through the time and expense of doing a full-blown ethylene oxide validation and find out that you had biocompatibility issues or you had to change your product and or that your product alone, the functionality is an issue. We had one, one uh, client that we dealt with with a problem where they came to us and they had validated their product. We're sterilizing for you know, a few months and found out that the ethylene oxide was, the process itself was uh, affecting their adhesive. So the device was falling apart, basically, and they had to recall their product. So obviously, functionality is something you want to see way up front and make sure that it's going to be able to withstand multiple cycles and, and multiple cycles of the worst case parameters that it may see to ensure there's no issues with that. So there's a lot of lists of things to do up front um, before you actually get to the validation part. Comparative resistance is what we call the cornerstone of the validation. Because if you remember, you're basically saying, if I have this biological indicator and it's sterile, and I can release my product. But you're not actually testing your product every, every load that you do. And so you have to make sure that, that the biological challenge you're using is really appropriate for your actual product. The comparative resistance is done for two different reasons. First one is you're going to find the most resistant locations on the device and basically find out can this device be sterilized with ethylene oxide? And if so, how long does it take to sterilize it? So you can recommend a cycle to the sterilizer. The second reason then is you're going to develop an appropriate process challenge device so you don't have to use your actual product if you have a very expensive device or it's something that's hard to inoculate. 
there's no problem if you want to use your actual product, but most people don't like to do that because it's, uh, it's costly and uh, time consuming. So the uh, procedure that you do for comparative resistance, we're basically going to take the device and inoculate all the different locations that are judged to be difficult to sterilize. Now since a lot of these sites are going to be easy and are going to drop out after the first few runs that we do, it's better to over inoculate and do a lot of sites. That way you get out of a lot of issues, regulatory questions about why you didn't inoculate this site or why didn't you inoculate that site. It doesn't cost any more to do it, so we inoculate basically all areas of the device and that, then it's going to run through a series of fractional cycles alongside a, a lot of different types of PCDs because up front we don't know which PCD is going to be most appropriate for your product. So we're going to shotgun it and use several different types of process challenge devices. We're going to intermix those with the product, place them in the sterilizer, and then run a series of fractional cycles. You may start somewhere, you know, 30 minutes, 60 minutes, 90 minutes. You may have to go up in you know, two hours, three hours, four hours. It really depends on the resistance of the product. So you're going to do all these different cycles starting from where everything starts to grow and then as you increase time, all these sites start dying off and you're left with the, the location or locations that's the hardest to sterilize. And that becomes, once you find the end point on that, that becomes basically your half cycle. Now the times we find out here at the lab are, are not necessarily going to correlate with the contract sterilizer, but but uh, it is going to give you a good idea. We have a good correlation and history of how long it's going to take on our end. So then once you do those fractional cycles, then you're going to test for sterility. You're going to, you're going to pull those biological indicators out, or maybe you had to inoculate a piece of suture or wire and place down in the lumen of the device. You pull all those out. You test them in growth media alongside with the different process challenge devices that you've used. And then you're going to choose whichever, uh, once you incubate those and uh, score for growth, you're going to choose the most appropriate PCD and find uh, the endpoint for that. So that's basically the procedure for comparative resistance. Another uh, common test that you're going to do, again, this is not as critical as it is with radiation, but it's still, you're still required to follow the ISO 11737 Part 1 document, which is the ISO BioBurden standard. And then basically what BioBurden is, BioBurden enumeration, just tells you numbers. It doesn't tell you anything about how hard they are to sterilize. It's just going to tell you how many are on the device. So this is a test that's more of a judge of your manufacturing process, uh, of how cleanly your manufacturing process is, uh, and your components and so on, than it is actually going to affect the sterilization as much. So you're going to choose random samples that are representative, that have gone through all the different handling that, have, that has happened, and you're going to test those for bioburden. So basically you're going to wash the organisms off of the device, filter them onto a filter, which is what you see in that picture, and then as that plate is incubated, each of those organisms starts to replicate and multiply. One organism becomes two, which becomes four, which becomes eight, and so uh, you go through logarithmic growth. So after a few days, you're going to see where it's visible to see with the naked eye. So you're going to have millions of organisms on there that, that grow into a colony that is uh, visible. So those are going to be counted and reported as colony forming units. And that basically just tells you how many organisms are on your device prior to sterilization. So with ethylene oxide, we typically will test, most people will test for aerobic bacteria and fungi. Um, Ten samples is, is a good number. Certain European countries may require you to do anaerobes and spore determination. This is really a good idea to do all of those on your initial characterization until you really have a good handle on what your true bio burden is, because your bio burden will fluctuate up and down as you go. So bio burden resistance, as like I said, you have all these different nasty organisms that are on your device. You need to make sure that none of those are more resistant than the spore strips. Because if you remember, this is where we're going to tie it together, that if you, if you kill those spore strips, we're saying that the product's sterile. So you need to make sure that whatever organisms just happen to be on the device through assembly, through the manufacturing, people touching it, that there's nothing strange on that. Although uh, Bacillus atrophius is considered the most resistant organism, there are occasionally organisms that mutate and change and become more resistant. Uh, many of you may be familiar with the organism Pyronema. That was a big issue several years ago. This was a mold that was found on Chinese cotton that was found to almost not be able to be sterilized with either ethylene oxide or radiation. It had to go through a combination of either an ethylene oxide cycle followed by a radiation cycle or a steam cycle followed by an ethylene oxide cycle, some kind of combination. So it was a very, very resistant organism. 
luckily it was not uh, pathogenic, but it does show how occasionally these organisms can change and become problems. So you always have to verify that there is nothing on your particular bio burden that's going to be more resistant. So the process is going to look a lot like the comparative resistance procedure. You're going to take equal numbers of products that, are, that is not inoculated. This is in the uh, comparative resistance, we're actually inoculating all the locations. In this one, we're not even going to open it. We're not even going to touch the device because we just want to assess what, what kind of organisms were on your product from your manufacturing process. So those are going to be laid side by side with your process challenge devices. And then uh, you, you go through the same type of thing. You're going to run some uh, fractional cycles and then test both for sterility. So an ideal result with this for this would be that your PCD show all growth and all your products killed off. Or that you can clearly show that your uh, bio burden is less resistant than your spore strips. But you do want to find an endpoint to show that you don't have a tailing effect going on where where you have some really resistant organisms that keep, keep extending out. So you always want to make sure you find an endpoint. So that's bioburden resistance. This is a new requirement of the ISO 11135 standard. In the old version, the 94 version, it stated that if your bioburden was less than 100 CFUs, then you didn't have to go through this, this type of testing. That was deliberately taken out of the standard, uh, mostly from the European point of view. But how we're, you know, we were basically stuck with that. and. Uh, we have to live with that now, and so it's now it's required that you do demonstrate that the resistance is is uh, not more than your spore strips. And it, it's a little bit of a gray area of when you repeat this. You may do it initially when you do your validation, but at what point do you have to repeat this? You know, is there a certain something that makes your uh, um, triggers you to repeat it, like your bio burden has a spike or things like that? So those can be some gray areas, and if you need some guidance on that, feel free to contact me offline and we can go through that. So, but bio burden resistance is a very important part of it. So then you get to the validation testing. Like most validations, you have IQ, OQ, and PQ. Um, with your PQ, because typically you're not going to have to worry too much about IQ and OQ unless you're sterilizing in-house. The contract sterilizer is going to take care of that for you, which is nice. So the PQ is broken down into physical and microbiological. And uh, physical are things like your ethylene oxide residuals and the byproducts. You're looking at your temperature and humidity distribution studies, uh, verifying all the parameters were met in all the different uh, validation cycles. And then you're going to set tolerances based on what the temperature and humidity data you get. Now, this is a change to the standard. Before, it had specific ones, like, like your, for example, your load had to be within 10 degrees Celsius. There could not be more a, a bigger spread than 10 degrees Celsius across the product load during exposure. That's been deliberately taken out as well, and you basically are setting your own tolerances of what your particular load shows, which is nice in that regard that you're not locked into something that you may still be able to show the amount of kill you need to, but you might be just outside that 10 degree window. That 10 degrees was basically just pulled out of the air. So that was another good change to the standard. The microbiological PQ, then that's where you're doing things like BI testing, product sterility if you're doing that. You have your bio burden enumeration, so all of that type of testing. Um, go through that. You're really proving your sterility assurance level in your half cycles in there. So that's considered the microbiological performance qualification. So when looking at a validation, you basically uh, you have your empty chamber profile. Again, a lot of times the contract sterilizer does basically a generic one every year that you can get for your records, or you may choose to do your specific cycle and have that run. Um, you're going to do a fractional cycle, and then a minimum of three half cycles. Basically, the requirement is you have to have three half cycles of your most resistant um, load configuration, product mixture configuration. So if you have, if you're going to change your load, like either validate a minimum load and a maximum load, or have a lot of product mixtures, then uh, then that's something you want to look at. That you may have to do additional half cycles to assess which one is really your worst case scenario. And then you're going to look at at doing a, at least one full cycle. A lot of people will do three full cycles initially in order to test residual samples from three separate sterilization lots. And in your full cycles, your half cycle again is where you're proving your sterility assurance level. The full cycles are where you're basically showing repeatability of your production cycle as well as uh, showing that your residual limits are under the specified limits. So you're going to have a lot of different testing. You're going to have bi biological indicators. One of the changes to the standards now is the numbers are now based on product volume instead of chamber volume. This is a great change for people that sterilize small loads. 
but they uh, could only get in a, a large sterilizer. Before, you had to have the number of BIs based on as if, as if you filled that entire chamber. So now it's only based on what you actually what you're actually sterilizing. So that's a good change as well. The temperature and, and humidity distribution studies. All your validation cycles are going to have temperature and humidity probes spread throughout your load. And uh, again, the requirement is to set your own tolerances of what you're seeing. And the numbers in this, again, are based on product volume. And then finally, you have EO residuals, which uh, the limits have been reduced. And uh, the limits are based on patient use, on what you have. This is a, from the uh, ISO 10993-7 document. And it really depends on how long the device is going to be used on a patient. So if it's something that's used up to 24 hours, a short-term uh, device that's only used you know, maybe for an hour or two, you're going to fall into this category. And it went from 20 milligrams for EO and 12 milligrams for ECH down to 4 and 9, respectively. So it, so it has changed quite a bit. But a lot of people, this does not affect because they're always under 1 anyway. So a lot of people it affects. Some people it doesn't affect. So check what your residual levels are and make sure that you're meeting these new limits of 4 and 9. Again, if you have then a prolonged device that's used more than 24 hours but less than 30 days, you have the same requirements for the first 24 hours, the 4 and the 9, but then it adds the 60 milligrams in the first 30 days. And then finally, if you have a permanent contact device or an implant, then uh, you have to uh, meet the lifetime requirement as well, which is considered 25,000 days. So you can divide that out, and that's uh, theoretically what they give you is how long you're going to live. So that's the amount that, that they take the total amount that was extracted off of the device and divide that by 25,000. So that's uh, how they determine that. So those are the residual limits that are, that are required. Then we come to requalification or revalidation. And uh, typically uh, what most people do is an industry standard is going to do a, a one-half cycle once a year. And, uh, but if you look at the standard, it really doesn't say you have to do that. It basically says that you, you review the original validation approximately annually and you determine the extent of requalification. So you look at what kind of changes you've had, if you change your, your product or your packaging, what kind of bio burden changes you've had, maybe if you've had uh, any kind of history of failures, things like that. But the current industry standard, is, and FDA likes to see this, is, is to do one half cycle annually. And that's, that's really to detect anything that you haven't thought about, any in inadvertent changes. And so that's uh, basically there. And if you have uh, a new product that you're going to what you want to adopt into your product, you can do that at this time, and you can do some work there. We can talk a lot more about product adoption. We go into a lot more of that in the, our full-length seminars that we have coming up. Uh, so that's the uh, requalification. But typically, one half cycle, once a year, a minimum of once every two years. You may do a, what, what's called a paper validation one year, but you have to do a, a physical run every two years. So that's a revalidation. There's a whole list of standards, and we're not going to go to these into a lot of detail so we can get to the questions. But uh, these are ones you want to be familiar with. Definitely the uh, ISO 11135 document, that, that's basically the document for ethylene oxide sterilization worldwide. It was just harmonized with EN 550. So EN 550 no longer is in existence, and it's been uh, brought into this document and harmonized into this two-part document, part one and part two, where part one is the requirements, and part two is guidance on how you meet that. 10993-7 uh, is a residual document, so you want to be familiar with that, with the different requirements that they have in there. And then there's a lot of different METIRs, and because the ISO 11135 documents changed, a lot of these have just revised as well. So there's TIR 14 and 15. Put a, definitely write down this one, TIR 16, Microbiological Aspects of Ethylene Oxide Sterilization. This is one that uh, you... Uh, want to put a, a check, mark, check mark by and definitely read this one. It talks about how you do validations and gives you a lot of detail, a lot of good information. Uh, TIR28 is also one that's very, very useful. Product adoption and process equivalency. That's if you come up with a new product and you don't want to have to go through this whole long validation process again, but you just want to adopt it into your current validated cycle. It goes into how that process is done. Or if you want to use multiple chambers at the same sterilizer without going through full validations of all of them, it talks about process equivalency. So that's a good, good standard as well. Um, these are biological indicator standards, part one and two of ISO 11138. These are more of the BI manufacturer's requirements. Um, but it's got a lot of good information in there that you want to be look, look at, be familiar with. And then, as I mentioned, now the ISO 11135 document states that you have to meet these if you're doing bio burden 
or product sterility type testing. So you have to go off of these standards as well. The old version just basically said you had to establish what your bio burden is, but it didn't tell you how you how you had to do that. So this one now so it points you to this standard and says you must meet 11737. So that's our list of standards. So we'll go ahead and open it up to questions. And Mike, you might have might want to say a few words. But I have my contact information there. We'll leave this slide up for a little bit while we go through the questions. And uh, there's information if you're interested in our seminars that are coming up. Again, there's one coming up in uh, October 5th through the 7th. And then I believe November 2nd is the one in Costa Rica. So you can uh, look on our website to find information about that. Or if you have just general information, you can contact sales at nelsonlabs.com. But I'll leave my email information up there. So feel free to contact me at any time with any questions. If you want to go into more detail, again, we crammed a lot of this in in this uh, 45 minutes. And so it's really meant to be, you know, take at least a day or so to go through this in, in depth. But uh, we really appreciate your time. We thank you for joining us. And uh, we'll open it up to questions at this time. But Michael, I'll give you a, say a few words. Thanks, Dan. Um, we've, uh, we're, we're appreciative of this information that you've shared with us today. Again, I just want to reiterate what Dan said is uh, he'll leave his contact information up here. If we can't get to your question, uh, please feel free to get, uh, contact him either by phone or by email. Um, we're going to get through as many questions as we possibly can, but we, we don't think we can get through all of them. So I'll turn the time back over to Dan um, for, for the question and answers, and um, we'll go from there. Okay, looks like we have some quest, good questions rolling in. Let me just pull these up. And I, we're not going to be able to get to them all. There's a ton of questions coming in. So, uh, One question here. Basically, it says, are quarter, quarterly dose audits required for ethylene oxide? If the eyes are conducted on each one, are, are QDA necessary? And you might want to qualify what QDA is. I'm not familiar with that. So send that, let that in. But basically, quarterly dose audits are not required for ethylene oxide. That's one of the advantages of ethylene oxide over radiation. With ethylene oxide, you're revalidating, in some cases, only every two years. <clears throat> but at a minimum, you're going to look at your revalidation once a year. But with, with radiation, because it is so dependent on your bio burden, and because that can go up and down so much, that's why they have to look at that every quarter to make sure that nothing's changed that's going to require that. So that's one of the key advantages of ethylene oxide. Because it is so much overkill built in, you don't have to do quarterly dose audits on that. There's a lot of uh, questions. Let's see. It says here, it says, you, can you also talk about pressures? You've mentioned te temperature, time, humidity, but pressure can affect our devices as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's a, that's a good point as well. There, the packaging and the product have to withstand multiple vacuum and pressure changes. There's a lot of those that go on throughout the uh, sterilization cycle. So that's something to look at, especially if you're using a gas mixture. We mentioned with 100% ethylene oxide, it's always done under a vacuum, so it's all subatmospheric. But if you're looking at a gas mixture, um, for instance, a 1090 cycle where you're only using 10% ethylene oxide, you have to basically use 10 times as much to get to the same gas concentration. So that's going to push that over to an overpressure cycle. So you're going to be a pressurized situation there. And so if you're using a mixture versus 100%, that can create unique effects on your product. So take a look at that. And you definitely want to do your, your functionality testing at the maximum end of those. So uh, pressure is something that you want to definitely look at. That's why the, the product in the, or the packaging on that has to be breathable. Otherwise, if you've ever gone up in the mountains camping, your, your potato chip bag almost explodes when you get, get up to high altitude because uh, it's not able to breathe. So you don't want uh, your packaging to burst seals and things like that. That was a good question as well. Um, another question here, it says, can you briefly go over the uh, adoption process? For product adoption, that's something where you come up with a new product that you would you like to adopt into a current, but your current validated cycle. So there's two aspects to that. The first one, part of that, is you need to look at the new product and say, OK, can this product by itself, will it fit the resistance of this product? Will it fit under my current process challenge device? Or is it more difficult to sterilize than what I'm currently testing? 
So the first step on that is you would go through a product or you go through a comparative resistance test and that's going to compare this new product to your, your hardest to sterilize product or your current process challenge device <clears throat> that you're using. So that's the first part. Side by side, is this product more difficult than what I'm already using? Now there's a second part to that 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 may the answer to that may be yes, it can be it can be sterilized in that, that same process because it is less resistant. But the second part is that when I put the quantities of this new product into my sterilization load, how does that affect the overall load? The product by itself may be easier to sterilize, but maybe it's a really dense product or something that's uh, going to be hard to sterilize when you have it packed in really tight in the load. So it could change your overall load, make your overall load harder to sterilize. So it's a two-part process with product adoption. First, you're going to do comparative resistance, and then you're going to look at when you put that into the load, you may do temperature and humidity profiles to see, compare that to your validation to see if that's something that changed against your current one. Is, it, is the uh, product coming up to temperature slower? Are there wider ranges? Is it affecting the sterility assurance level? Uh, you know, a lot of people will do maybe a single half cycle just to be conservative on it. So uh, that, that's one as well. So let's get to a couple more questions. We still have about 10 more minutes. We'll try to get, get to all these. Here's a good question that a lot of people are probably uh, interested in. It says, can you explain the batch release method? And also, how do you determine what dose parameters to use in a batch release method? So what batch release is? Batch release is a way that you can release a load of product without going through the full validation process. But to, to be able to claim that it's sterile, you, if you remember, you have to go through and be able to show you can kill those 10 to 6 BIs in half the time. So really what the batch release is, it's, it's almost like a, a mini validation that you're going to do on your product load. It's really common with people that are doing product for clinical trials or animal studies or, or something like that. So um, what you're going to do is you're going to do a half cycle to show your sterility assurance level followed by a full cycle. So the ba basically your actual product that you want to use for this clinical study is going to go through both. So it's going to go through one and a half times. So as part of that, you have to also assess that the residuals go through one and a half times as well to show that that effect, as well as your packaging and functionality, you want to make sure that it can withstand that. But the actual product will go through one and a half times. You'll do a little bit of bio burden testing up front just to kind of get an idea of what the bio load on the product is. Go through the half cycle. Uh, typically, people don't have enough product to do the full comparative resistance testing. So on those batch release testing, it's more common to actually inoculate the actual devices and have to use actual inoculated products. As uh, the comparative resistance test may take 20 to 30 samples, and usually when we tell people that, they about fall out of their chair and they can't come up with that many when it's when they're when they're just doing that small amount. And so you're going to inoculate some product, go through the half cycle. That half cycle completes. You're going to pull those inoculated product out, test those. You're going to test some samples for product sterility because you need to show the bio burden resistance. And then you're going to put new samples that are inoculated that haven't gone through yet, and those are going to go along for the ride for the full cycle so that you can make sure that you uh, have met the sterilization parameters in the full cycle as well. And then uh, you're going to pull your residual samples out that um, have gone through both to assess that your actual product has also gone through both. The final thing with that, where it's really not part of a validation, but if your device is something that requires LAL testing or pyrogen to be uh, pyrogen-free or, or a non-pyrogenic, you would have to do LAL testing as well. So in essence, you do a, a mini validation with a reduced sampling size, and the product goes through a half and a full. Um, if you do that, it, you can do that, and if you repeat that process three times, and you can have that process validated where you can just go through um, the normal just full cycle alone after you've done it three times. So that's the uh, batch release question. Again, if there's any more issues on that, we do a lot of that here. We have seven different sterilizers. We're not, we're, we don't act as a contract sterilizer, but we do um, batch release type testing for people and expose product for the, that half and full cycles. Um, here we've decided to just be able to take on product that we can definitively prove that is sterile, so we will only sterilize product that does go through the batch release stuff. Uh, we can't validate a cycle here and then just do routine testing. We just decided not to take that on for liability reasons and so on but we can help out with that uh, batch release process. And it's a fairly quick and uh, cheap process to go through. 
that can get you product fairly simple or, and uh, pr pretty quick. Usually it's about a roughly between two and three week turnaround time because your product sterility test is going to go 14 days. So that's the thing that's going to hold that up. Residual testing typically takes around 10 to, to 14 uh, days as well. So, uh, you know, it's roughly about a three-week process. And it just depends on how many samples you test for what different types of testing. So that's the batch release process, which we could do almost a whole seminar on that alone. Um, uh, here's a question here that says, can you give examples of the most challenging locations within the ethylene oxide sterilization chamber? Uh, it really depends on the sterilizer itself. An interesting fact about that is if you look at how they're constructed, a lot of times the, the uh, big industrial sterilizers, they're, typically they're jacketed. That's how the chamber is heated is a water jacket or a steam jacket that has basically tubes that go through the inside. It's kind of basically a double-walled vessel, and you have basically hot water or steam that circulates through there to heat it. But a lot of times the doors are not jacketed. so. Typically, your worst case location is going to be in the front by the door, um, or if it's double door sterilizer that's not jacketed, the front or the back, and at the bottom, because heat's going to rise. So typically, the, the bottom front is traditionally your cold location. But one of the requirements is to put, uh, put temperature and humidity probes and spread throughout your entire load. A lot of times, you see the cold spot, per se, is, is not really a, a cold spot. It might be a half a degree or a degree or so colder. And that may tend to move around from cycle to cycle. But if you were to look at one area that you would definitely want to hit, it would be the bottom front by the door. And that's important when you're doing a minimum and a maximum load. We talked a tiny bit about that where you have to do additional half cycles if you're going to do different load sizes. Because if you have a minimum load, like say just a few boxes, a lot of times contract sterilizers are going to just open the door and place that in the door, push it in, and then shut the door. So it may be the entire load, those few boxes may be in that cold spot. and so. Even though you don't have as much product to sterilize, that could be your worst case situation because the entire load is in a colder area of the chamber. So that's uh, that. But each one's specific on that. Let's see. There's a uh, this one right here. Okay. There's a question here that says which products need LAL testing. Um, a lot of times that depends on your regulatory what you're claiming on your device, but in a but typically, I guess a, a blanket statement would be it's devices that have direct or indirect circulatory contact. So definitely a device that's going to go into a vein or an artery um, or a device that has cerebral spinal fluid contact. So all devices don't necessarily have to have that testing done. And some devices are somewhat questionable. So if, if you have any questions about a specific device, you can contact Zach Anderson here at Nelson. But uh, really, it's the devices that have direct circulatory contact or cerebral spinal fluid contact that have to do that. But a lot of times, people have to check with their regulatory um, departments to see really what you're claiming on it. So it depends on if you claim it to be um, non-pyrogenic or pyrogen-free, which those are two different things. You don't really necessarily want to claim that it's pyrogen-free, because that means there's not any at all on there. But if it's non-pyrogenic, it means that you're beneath the levels that are outlined in, in USP or that FDA requires. So again, if you have any questions on LEL testing, you can contact Zach Anderson. So it looks like we'll take one more question here. So let's see. Uh, let's scroll through here. And uh, like again, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Um, there's a lot of questions here that we never got to. Um, here's a good one that, that comes up quite a bit. Is it says, device for biocompatibility tests, would you recommend 2x or higher? And that's a great question because a lot of times you're doing biocompatibility up front. And if that's um, a lot, at that point, you don't have a sterilization cycle yet. You may not even know what it's going to be. So uh, we do a lot of exposures for people that are doing biocompatibility testing. So what we'll do is we'll come up with a worst case cycle. Um, typically, it's going to be probably uh, way worst case because we want to be conservative and make sure that it really um, is going to be very rigorous and challenged to device. But you always want to go through at least two times or 2x cycles. Because uh, at some point, as, if you're sterilizing with ethylene oxide, uh, no matter how long you've done it, usually everybody has to sterilize a, pr a product load twice for whatever reason. And we've seen a lot of different reasons. It may be something as simple as forgetting to put BIs in. We actually had a case where that they, they went to pull the BIs out and found out there weren't any. And they had just forgot to put them in. Whoops. So uh, they had to reprocess the load. Or it, obviously, if you have a BI failure, then that uh, you'll typically have to re-sterilize the load for that case and put new BIs in it. 
So anytime you're doing biocompatibility up front, or if you're going to do functionality or package testing and ethylene oxide residuals, you want to do all three of those testing or, or make sure you expose it to 2x or even more. <clears throat> some people will do 3x sterilization just to be worst case because there's going to be at some point you're going to have to uh, re-sterilize a load. It's one of those things where it's either pay now or pay later, but the time to do it is not when you uh, find out that you have an issue because then you have to stop everything, do all the required testing, and usually at that point it's a, it's a disaster to try to get everything done when you have product on back order and so on. So it's recommended to do it up front, and that way if that situation ever arises, then you, can, uh, you have the data in your pocket that you've already done, and you can show that it's okay to sterilize it twice, and you can just reprocess the load. So uh, it looks like we're about out of time for questions, but again, feel free to contact me. Uh, Mike, I'll let you finish up here, but uh, again, we thank you, and, and please feel free to contact us if there's any questions, if we can help you. Um, check out the uh, dates for the seminar. It goes into a lot more detail on not just ethylene oxide, but general microbiology, uh, general sterilization, radiation, ethylene oxide, um, some reusable device testing, biocompatibility, um, environmental monitoring, and packaging. So it hits you with basically everything you need to know uh, about medical devices. So check out the website on that one if you're interested. Again, the next one's coming up in Orlando, Florida. It's a great time to take the kids to Disney World. So thanks, Mike. I'll give the turn time over to you and keep the questions coming. Thanks, Dan. Uh, we were appreciative of uh, Dan's time and, and going through this uh, process with us. Um, again, I just want to, to uh, publicize our next webinar, which will be on radiation sterilization. There's always a good rivalry between those two. Um, that will be on October 27th uh, of this year, and it will be again uh, at 11 a.m. Mountain Time or 1 p.m. Eastern Time, 10 a.m. Pacific. Um, and you'll be able to register for that soon on our website. Again, we're, we're happy that you were able to attend our event today. And again, if you want to fu receive future updates uh, when we're doing these types of things, you can always follow, follow Nelson Labs on Facebook or Twitter. Um, and if you've missed any parts of this webinar, you'll be able to view it on our website uh, under the webinars page. We will have it up there shortly, and you'll be able to, again, view this uh, same presentation. Again, we thank you for your time, and we hope you have a great day.